listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that, that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing the brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Welcome to Sasquatch Syndicate. I'm your host, Chuck, out in Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at sasquatchsyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. For those participating in the Sasquatch Syndicate monthly t-shirt giveaway, this month's winner was Al Siebertson from Compton, Maryland. So Al, thanks for listening to the show and please check your Facebook for winner notification. Happy October, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful fall. I swore I blinked and uh, we're already into month two of um, the fall season and Halloween's just around the corner. And by the way, um, we've got a special treat this October. You're going to get almost four episodes. We've got a special on October 13th, Friday the 13th. Of course, we have the 50th anniversary of the Patterson-Gimlin film coming up on October 20th. And then, of course, we have a Halloween special. So stay tuned for that. And before I forget, I wanted to say thank you for Bill Stevenson and Janet Walucci, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, for writing into the show and just uh, talking again about uh, how podcasts get them through the day, get them through work, and uh, how our show helps you guys keep keeping on. So um, thanks very much for that. Uh, If you're out there listening and grinding at work or simply just trying to get through another day, I just wanted to say we know the struggle's real. Uh, We want you to know that no matter what you have going on in your life, uh, we, Paul and I, believe in you guys, and you can make a positive impact every day simply with a smile. So no matter what you got going on, remember, kill it with kindness and uh, really have some fun with it. And hey, if you don't want to smile today and you want to be cranky and miserable and lay in your bed like a blind, dusty, hairy cave dweller, uh, that's okay too. But we know there's a smile in there somewhere, and nothing's going to hold you back this month. Thanks for everyone that wrote into the show regarding the new website. Uh, That was completed back September 25th, so we're really happy to have that behind us. And uh, we always appreciate your feedback, so thanks again for writing in with the uh, comments and suggestions. We really appreciate it. Also, we do have a new free member area. And I do mean free. Um, You can do that just by registering. You go out to our website and then just hit register. Um, But there's some really nice store discount coupons in there. There's some behind the scenes access. So take a peek around. Uh, Again, you can sign up at sasquatsyndicate.com. And uh, for those that went out there, I'd like to hear your feedback. But uh, let me know what you thought of my Bobo cosplay down at Rose City Comic Con in Portland. Uh, I really thought I nailed that. But uh, check it out and see what you guys think. All right. So you guys ready? My dear sweet friends, it's Saturday night. What are you guys doing? Send us a note. Contact us at sasquatsyndicate.com. We want to know. And we know that we owe you guys some really great episodes. And it's going to be amazing all the way from here until January. Because when it starts raining, that's pretty much all Paul and I do. We sit inside, we look out the window, and we podcast. So let's set the mood. Um, With us tonight on Sasquatch Syndicate is one of my favorite researchers, musicians, Fellow acquaintance here in Wenatchee, Washington, Paul Graves. He's been a researcher for more than 25 years, an amazing musician. But you don't have to hear it from me. Let's hear it from Paul. So let's kick off this series for October. Let's do it right. And we're going to start off the show tonight with the Sono Call.
So, Paul Graves, uh, welcome to Sasquatch Syndicate. And can I just say, man, that song's on fire, brother. That was just a classic, but uh, we'll get into your music uh, a little bit later. Um, welcome to the show, and again, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit of your background for our listeners and, and, and maybe really how you got into research. Sure. Well, you know, um, a lot of it was just growing up here in Washington State. Um, I'd heard of stories when I was younger uh, going to camp and uh, as a camper and then later becoming a counselor, and we would take kids up into the mountains for for three days at a time and, uh, you know, deep into the mountains. We were all young, you know. I mean, it was like 19, 20-year-olds taking a bunch of 11, 12-year-olds up into the mountains for three days, you know. And uh, so we'd heard, I'd heard stories back then, but then um, it was in the late 80s. I, what really set it off for me again was hearing a story when I was over at my sister's house. And some, some of their friends were over there, and there was a big, there was a show on about, they were talking about Bigfoot, and it was one of the early shows or whatever. And, and after the show, the guy just was kept, he was kind of quiet, but he looked up and he goes, well, you know, I've seen one of these things. And, whoa really you know and that was the first pretty much local story you know from around here that i started getting because as you know you know we're back right up to the cascade mountains here and there's basically five million acres you know at our back doorstep here and so there's a lot of territory around here and a lot of people hunt get out in the woods and stuff like that and camp and fish and do all that kind of stuff so you know i'd heard the stories but then when i had heard it you know kind of from you know, at first account, like someone had really seen one of these, it just really set something off of me. And, and from that time on, I just, I was on a mission. It was like, I started just seeking out, you know, other people that might have seen these things. And it was pretty, pretty amazing, you know, um, over the years, you know, it was like, whether a person had seen one or had an encounter or maybe their brother or cousin or friend or something, but there was a, there was actually a pretty big connection, especially a town like this, you know, there's lots of towns like this. And so, yeah, that's kind of what got it started was, was back then. And then since then it, it was just it's kind of been a continued, I've got a database that I started back then and I've just continued to add, add to it, you know, with people I've talked to and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, Paul, when you first started researching here in the Wenatchee Valley, um, how did folks know how to get a hold of you? Did you contact local authorities, and did folks want to talk about the subject? Um, you know, really, how did you become kind of the researcher here in central Washington? Well, basically, it was it was my me and my personality. It was me going out and, and basically asking people in a matter in a matter of a fact way. Um, to literally, I mean, in the early years, I would be, I would be asking people in line at the grocery store, you know, <laughs> and, um, but in a real matter of a fact way, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wasn't trying to be funny about it or anything. I just kind of bring it up and you could tell when, when someone was being real because they wouldn't get all funny back with you. They would just kind of turn and look at you. And sometimes I'd get the story right there. Other times, you know, they'd say, well, let's talk, you know? And, and so, um, that kind of got a lot of things started for me as far as like you know find finding people but i i wasn't shy um but i did it in a real matter of fact way and just came right out you know and and um it was it was kind of amazing you know you would get both sides of the of, of the of the coin there but a lot of times people would just kind of look at you and you know they were real matter of fact and they'd end up telling you a story of what they saw and, and had happened to them and you know, and then that kept happening over and over again, of course. And, you know, so I knew something was going on. And, Paul, you said it was uh, extensive here, and I don't think a lot of people realize where Wenatchee, Washington is, but we're just on the border of the Cascades. And so um, if you go out on a map and check that out, you'll really see how dense this is um, just west of uh, Wenatchee Valley. Um, but, Paul, did you ever get out and talk to anybody in the tribes, the Yakima, uh, the Chinook, or the uh, Wenatchee tribes? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it was it was it was mostly local people, and um, yeah. And I have interviewed people from those tribes. There's all those tribes you named. I have friends friends with. So, um, but yeah, no. They're the local um, 
Well, for instance, on the Indian end of it, the local um, Indian name for the for the Sasquatch is called to Chonato. That might not be pronounced right exactly right, but Chonito, Chonato, and it translates to night people. So that's interesting in, its, in itself right there. Then the uh, there's a ridge that goes up right behind my house here, right behind the valley. It's called Mission Ridge, and it goes up to almost 7,000 feet. There's actually a ski hill up there, and, and uh, it's a north-facing ridge. So this huge north-facing ridge, and then one actually right below, right at the bottom of it, right at the base of it. And uh, the first settlers that came to town, they named this thing that they would see up there, the old man of Mission Ridge, in reference to a wrinkled face-covered, old-looking, hairy thing they would see up there from time to time. The hunters would see So they named it the old man of Mission Ridge. And I've actually talked to a number of old, well, some of the older generation people that remember that name. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's a history right here. I think a lot of places have histories. You know, you, you go up and down. There's a lot of towns in Washington, and, and you go into them, and it's, you know, the Yakima area, for instance, you know, and, and, uh, and many other, many places in western Washington, but, you know, also in eastern Washington. And they do have somewhat of a history with these things, especially if you're backed up close to the mountains and forests. So, so Paul, uh, just a, around research, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, when you started, kind of what your techniques were for research, gathering evidence, and then kind of where you at with it now. That's a good question. And, you know, in the early years, we, we didn't really look at it like doing research or whatever. Um, you know, we heard about these things and we knew they were out there, but, you know, we didn't really think about really trying to do anything about it or anything like that. But I will tell you that me being a musician, long-time musician, and um, uh, I would I I play my guitar almost. I mean, I do take it every time I go into the woods. And I mean, I I spend a lot of times in the mountains and and uh, camping and backpacking. We have a cabin up in the mountains, and, and so you know, I, I'm out there 12 months out of the year. I do a lot of snowshoeing in the winter because I have my winters off, and uh, in the early days, we just kind of took it for what it was, and then about, well, my first, well, I didn't, see, I didn't think there was anybody else like me <laughs> that was doing this stuff. I thought it was half crazy in, in the early years, and I didn't, you know, even though I was asking people, I didn't really want to tell other people kind of what I was up to, you know, because I, I kept it under, kind of under the thumbs, and I didn't really think there was anyone else doing it until... I had heard about this organization called the BFRO, and that's when I learned that there was other folks doing things. The BFRO and then, and then some local folks in Washington where we had this group called the WBFRO or whatever it was, which was a subgroup who was just Washington folks. So we started that, and then um, I did go on a couple expeditions. I think I did about three expeditions total. And it, it, there was just something, you know, that I, first of all, now, you know, I'm a, a, I'm a true believer of this even then. I don't really think you need to go on an expedition to have a to have an encounter with these things. It's, it's kind of different than that, you know. And I've learned that really doing certain things, you can you, can, you have better luck almost bringing, you know, a Bigfoot to you or to your surroundings or to what you're doing. And... So me playing music, you know, early in the early days, all the way through my whole life, I think, you know, I well, I know. I've had encounters with these things coming right up into our camp while we're sitting around playing music. And um, so it's, I've always kind of just had that attitude too, you know. But then the, the expedition thing came along and the whole, New way of kind of doing things, but you know there was some there was some issues with it was you know you know like in, in anything when you got a big group of people there's a big power of suggestion you know and so if everyone's there and this and that it just there was just some things happening that just didn't seem right or they just seemed too pushed or whatever that didn't seem normal for this for this research that I was used to you know I was and so I kind of just shied away from all that stuff after a while and and um, 
uh, or you know the expedition end of it and just did did my I've always done a lot of my own research by myself but then I also go out with with some good folks and I think that's the best way to do research you know small group or whatever and uh not that a large group can't draw them in because again that's that's really what it's all about you know I think a lot of different things can gain the curiosity of things but they also are very cautious and and their safety is you know they they know when they're in a good situation, I think, or a bad situation. But let's just put it that way. Uh, just like we, you know, are people, humans, and animals, you know, we can sense certain animals or or a person, you know, we can kind of sense. Same same deal, you know, maybe just magnified even more, you know. So, um, yeah. So do but it, my research has evolved. I mean, as far as um what I do, and that's mainly just me becoming what I call a citizen scientist. And so, like, for instance, one of the things, I have a recording studio in my basement here, and I've recorded my own music for a long time. So I took, I thought, well, wildlife recording, and that's something I've always loved doing. And I always take my recorder anyway in case I get an idea for a song or something, I can record it. So, so we started recording many years ago audio wildlife, and I learned how to I have a spectrograph where you can actually put your sounds into a spectrograph and visually look at it because uh, all all North American animals have a known voice print and a hertz range, you know, that they uh, that's known to that animal. And so what we can do is when you put these sounds in, if you have a suspect uh, call. It's a little odd, put it in there, and at least we can see what it is not, you know. And so that's been kind of fun playing around with that kind of stuff. And over the years, I've gotten pretty good at it. Um, and so, you know, just I think everybody just should become a citizen scientist. Go learn what the plants are about out there. Go, you know, anything that you can teach yourself about the, the environment that's out there. And, and uh, it, it just, I think it just helps a, a lot. You know, people with the, the tree structures and stuff, for, for instance, that's something I really believe in because I've had some very, very unusual things happen with that whole thing, and I started collecting them like over 10 years ago. Yeah, so let's uh, talk a little bit about that because I know that uh, you've got some really great documented, uh, not only tree structures, but experiences where things kind of popped up overnight, and uh, recently we were down at the Wenatchee Valley uh, Museum, and uh, Paul Dunn, uh, kind of a kickoff there on uh, one of their series. And for the listeners out there um, that weren't there to hear that, maybe just talk a little bit about that. The first place was at this private property. Where, where, <laughs> it's kind of ironic because this lady would stand out, or it was in Granite Falls, and she'd stand out on her deck and, and sing a lot. They had outdoor speakers. But on their property, she had seen this thing a couple times on their property, Sasquatch. So... We went over there and started hiking around their property, and we found all these small little teepees back on their 25 acres. And they were super tight, like perfect little teepee-looking things on the ground, two, two to three feet high with a horizontal stick always going through the through the cross members, kind of holding it in place, kind of like a keyway or something. And... It, I mean, it was it was really bizarre. And I asked, we asked the people. They didn't make them. They hadn't seen them. They didn't know where they came from. And then we would come back a week or two weeks later, and some of them would be gone and new ones built in, in other locations. So there was something going on back there. And this was private property. No one went back on this property. I mean, there there wasn't humans back there sitting there making these little these little things. So something was going on with that, and then that was the beginning. Since that time, I really did a lot of research, and I started finding some really odd things all over at different locations. But then I started seeing people kind of getting misguided on the whole thing, too. And, and you know, because we all copy lines in nature and, and art. You know, even humans, when we build, build buildings, you know, we're using lines, and, and we're copying nature, basically, you know. And if the Sasquatch makes something like structures and, and things, that's what they're going to do too. It's not, it's not nothing new. It's just what they're doing out there. But nature can also do that. And so it's really hard to determine sometimes what the two are. Um, but I believe a lot of it is, is 
is naturally made. I know it is because I have 26 acres of forest and, and I've watched it grow for the last over 10 years, you know, and I know what winters do. And I mean, you would not believe, you know, the, the arches and the, and the trees all coming down in one area into a crown that make it these exits, all different kinds of things that winter does to trees. And so, um, which I've documented all that, but I do know that sometimes they do manipulate certain forest material. And to know the difference is, is to see it change, you know, within a short time of period. And, you know, you know that it's not weather related or whatever. It's, there's something else going on there. Yeah. Last um, summer we did an episode called Cousin It with uh, Jonathan. And uh, he was describing these little teepee tree structures he found along the road. And he actually sent me some videos. I'll post those out on the uh, members area for those out there that are uh, logging in on the website. So you can check those out. But uh, yeah, and uh, Paul, I'll go ahead and send those over to you. I'd love to hear what you have to say about them. Yeah, no, I would love to see that. Thank you. So Paul, uh, just here in Washington and, you know, really across the U.S., you know, the average hiker, um, you know, they may stumble across evidence or potential evidence um, just so they don't blow it. Kind of what are your thoughts on research and really what should you know, folks be keeping track of and uh, kind of what's your approach or thoughts on that? Yeah, so a photo is always good, but you uh, you got to always make sure that you put some kind of scale item in there. Don't just take a photo of it, no matter what it is, whether you're, you know, photographing a footprint or a pile of scat or a possible tree break that looks weird or whatever. You know, try to get some kind of scale in there. Stick your hand up there if you have to, something. Um, a dollar bill is always good. It's six inches long. Um, if it is a good print, of course, you know, you got to realize prints are very rare and hard to find, especially in, in the forest material that's, that's out there. You know, there's just not a lot of good substrate to record them. But they they are found, and they are – people do stumble across trackways sometimes. So if you think you've got a, a good track and you don't have anything, any way to do anything with it, you know, protect it. Put, put – find some bark or something and place it over the track so it doesn't get stepped on or rained on. And then you can always come back at a later time, whether you didn't have a camera or you wanted to get a better picture or video and or cast it with some kind of material. So, Paul, you talked earlier about, you know, talking to folks that have had, uh, you know, eyewitness encounters or experiences, but uh, had those folks reported to local authorities? Um, what did you hear? Well, that's, you know, a lot of people don't really know what to do. And and, and I'll tell you, you know, it all really depends on, on the person. I, a lot, over 50%, you know, probably more like 70% of the people that I talk to over here, they don't want to report it. I mean, who are they reporting it to? You know, it's like, you know, they just don't care. And, and I know that for a fact because there's people that have them around their property and they just, they don't want other people coming around. You know, they, they don't have a problem with them. Um, so, you know, I guess it just all depends on the person. I mean, if, I suppose if you want to go to a website or something like that and report it, you can. But I, I guarantee, I, I was with the BF for, for a number of years and, you know, the amount of, of, uh, sightings that's on their database is so small compared to, to reality. You know, my, my database, I have a way bigger, that, that it doesn't even come close, theirs doesn't to what, you know, the amount of, that I have, and that's just me. So you think about all the other ones that, that go unreported too, and, you know, then you start really seeing there's, you know, there's so many reports that never probably get published. And, and to me, that's okay if the person doesn't want it you don't talk about it, that's okay. I guess I, in one of my talks I did a couple of years ago, I, this, I said this, and I don't know, I kind of believe this, and this, is, and this is just me, but at this point in time in history, I believe, you know, probably half the world knows about these things, and maybe the other half shouldn't know. So who knows? Yeah, and, you know, um, Paul and I, of course, uh, here at Sasquatch Syndicate, we get a lot of encounters. And people will call in or share a story, but uh, don't really want to come on the air. And uh, that's okay, too. But it, it really is 
amazing how many people we talk to that have had encounters that uh, really haven't reported them or uh, wanted to come out and speak about it. Yeah. So, Paul, in terms of your own experiences, you know, with these creatures and maybe some of your own encounters, uh, could you share a little bit, um, you know, maybe of some of the ones that uh, really stood out at you and some of those experiences? Uh, well, yeah, one one of the good ones, and and it was, unfortunately, I didn't I didn't see it face to face because I was in my tent, but it was right outside my tent at this point. And um, it was over in the in the Olympics, up along the Hump Tulips, and uh, it's February, you know, winter. It didn't rain at all day. Me and my colleague from from here, Josh, we drove over, and we had permission to sleep out on this peninsula where where the Hump Tulips goes in a big bend. It makes a huge, big, wide bend, and this is out on some private property, and it's close to where. This guy, Jim Henry, had had a number of encounters when he had his property there. When he was clearing his land, this Bigfoot would stand back in the trees and watch him, kind of follow him around and stuff on his property, but always staying back in the trees, you know. Yeah, um, sleeping out there, we, we we got there and we set up our tents, and so the, the river was in flood stage, too, at this point. And uh, we were just on this side of some trees, and then there was a little rock gravel bar that went down in the, to the river. And uh, we tried getting a fire going, and it was raining raining too hard and stuff. I mean, we had it going for a while, and then we just kind of gave up on it. It was like we only had a little bit of wood, and it was getting wet. You know, we had to cover it, and it, it was just getting to be a hassle. So it was like, now let's just go sit in the rig for a while. So we went over and sat in the rig and listened to some music. We had our windows partway down and kept hearing something over by our tents and didn't quite know what it was and kept looking over there. But okay, let me back it up a little bit. So I placed a recorder out earlier, kind of down by the river and uh, just inside the tree line from the river and uh, went down there after a couple hours and I noticed the, the batteries were dead. I just put new batteries in them. Like, oh, crap. So I went back up, changed the batteries, and at this time it started sprinkling a little bit. So I thought, well, I'm going to put it, put the thing in my tent. So I put it inside my tent, the recorder, and turned it back on with some fresh batteries. And, and so all this has happened. So it's late at night. It's about 12, 31 o'clock. And you can hear. So we finally said, oh, let's go crash. We're going to crash. So we start walking over there. And on the recorder, I didn't know this at this time, but right when I get right next to my tent, you can hear us talking, coming up to the tent, and then the recorder goes off. And so, boom. I crawl in my tent. It's dead. Battery's dead again. At this point, I'm tired. I didn't want to get up again and go change batteries, walk across, get more batteries, which I should have. Been, you know, always. <laughs> the way this stuff happens. <laughs> okay. So, literally, we got in there and we're and we're just laying there. We each had our own tent, and. Uh, kind of lined up in a little line right there. And within five minutes, we heard kind of like this mud suckling sound. It sounded like something like walking over, but kind of slow over towards us. And so just laying there. And all of a sudden, just the loudest, it sounded like a car wreck. A tree came down and crashed. And I mean, it was real violent, you know, like, real violent. And then this this thing beat on its chest. I mean, and it, it beat on its chest like it was like something out of a movie, a King Kong movie. It was so loud. And then it screamed and it, the scream turned into a roar. It was so loud and deafening. And I mean, at this point, I, I was really, I, I thought this was it. I thought, I'm in the river. I'm done. I mean, <laughs> I was and I was pretty much frozen with fear, you know, and Josh was too. We were both just we could we couldn't even hardly talk. And um about ten minutes later, I guess we were both out. It was just like boom, we were out. Woke up the next morning, birds were chirping, you know, everything was fine and that I mean it happened just like that. And we walked over to where our fire was, we were trying to get a fire and right between where we'd been walking between this 
log chair and this other log, there was two sticks in a perfect X marker leaning right up against that. And we'd been walking through there all, all night. So, yeah, that's, that was quite the encounter. And I actually wrote a song. Um, Jim Henry uh, is the name of the song. And actually, it's a pretty popular song out there uh, among the big footers and stuff. And with that, I give you Jim Henry by Paul Gray.
just uh, another classic piece. So uh, just can't uh, thank you enough for sharing that with the audience there. Thank you. So, Paul, last uh, winter here in Wenatchee Valley, you tracked a um, purported Sasquatch trackway before it just came to really an abrupt halt, um, kind of at the edge of a property. Can you talk a little bit about that? And have you ran into other stories or tracked other trackways that just really come to an end where there's really no description on how the creature got out of there? I've witnessed it before, but not to this extent. I mean, this was this was literally, you know, this was so mind blowing that it was. And that you got to remember, this was at the second location of the trackway. So the first part of the trackway, we had tracked it just up to about a mile, a little over a mile, and that's where I got the track, where I casted the track in the dirt, where it stepped on the embankment, you know, and I got the toes in. I mean, it was so dug into the dirt, it was just. It was perfect. Those, those toes were so clean and perfect in that dirt. It, you could actually see dermal ridges in the bottom of the toes. And I got some dermal ridges on the cast. So um, we tracked it from there up into the ravine. I went on Google Earth the day before, and I knew it was going to go up into that ravine. And it went into this ravine, and that's when it did the double back thing, and it went down into the ravine and it made this big circle. And then it come back, and then it jumped over the trail nine feet from one one track to the next track and then started headed east towards this house where I got the call from the guy the second day, these old folks that said there was tracks going through their backyard. And so there's basically just a big field in between and an orchard in between there and those people's house. So, yeah, it was... I mean, it was really mind-boggling. So just kind of, uh, you know, recalling that experience from last year, um, was there a lot of wildlife in that area? I know, like, uh, you know, a lot of properties have open range here, just kind of back right up to ravines and, you know, kind of dense forest or even kind of on the edge of a ridge, uh, so to speak. But can you talk a little bit about the property? So he's always got deer that go through his backyard. He doesn't put a fence up just for that for that reason because there's always just tons of deer, and there's, so there's a major deer trail hooks going all the way around on this trail going all the way around in the backyard and then the tracks the big tracks came down the edge of the house like they were following the deer and they were on that deer track for a minute and then it ventured off the deer track in just to, into the plain snow the clear snow and so the first one when it veered off the the, uh, the deer track the first track was there and it was kind of turned at an angle and then the very next print was literally from heel to heel was 13 feet and in between it though there was like this weird it was like a, a, a backwards V kind of thing and at first I thought oh that is that another little track there and then the more the more I started looking at it and looking and looking it was like oh I know what that is exactly what it is it's 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 the hand and it's the back of the hand. And so it must have, like, that 13-foot step, I think it was coming down, and it got spooked because there was these little kitty cat tracks that were coming out. And it either I don't know if a cat spooked it or a deer spooked it or what, but so 13 feet from heel to heel with this odd, looks like a backwards handprint in, right in between those two prints. Then it took a couple six foot, and these are perfectly in line at this point. Now it's perfectly in line again, and it took three or four six foot from heel to heel, about six foot four, six foot five, heel to heel, and there were these small little kitty cat tracks coming out, and they came within about a foot of the trackway, and then they didn't go back. They just went one way. Now, I don't know if that's related, whatever. That's just I'm just telling you what I saw. So then after those six foot steps, all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm so I'm walking these out. I'm like, what? And the next one is literally, I measured it's 10 feet. It's like 9 foot 11 or something like that. It's 10 feet. I measured the next one. It's 10 feet in a row perfectly. And so the guy, the guy standing there, the homeowner, he's smoking a cigar. He goes, he looks over. He goes, well, you know, there's my nightlight right there. And right where those 10 foot steps were is... Uh, motion activated light was right there underneath his deck. 
so it looks like yeah, that thing was walking and it got lit up and it took you know all of a sudden now it's, it's, it takes two ten foot steps. After the two ten foot steps, it's almost to the edge of the end of the yard now. And there's big arborvitaes that go up to each side of the house from the street all the way to the back of the property. Tall, big, big hedge bushes, big tall ones. And so after the, the last two ten foot steps. Now it's the, the tracks are going side by side at an angle, so at about four feet apart. So it, all of a sudden now it's shuffling side by side, four feet, and then there was a small retaining wall that jumped down into the, the neighbor's yard, the next lot down, and it goes over to that to that wall and it jumps and it's about. 15 feet from there to the last tracks that I find. And what it does is from there, they're going sideways, kind of headed south direction. And then all of a sudden, it, it they go off the wall, and now they're pointed in like a northeast direction, like it completely turned around in midair, and the tracks are side by side. At this point, there's two tracks and a big, big, weird, odd drag mark in between the two tracks, like it might have had some prey or something in its hands, and then it bounded up or jumped up from there. The only way I can, what I can say is it got into those hedge bushes and made its way back out the street, because literally, because I talked to both neighbors on both sides. I, I physically talked to them, and I, I mean, we looked and looked and looked, and those tracks were in no one else's backyards. That was it. They, I could not find any more tracks from that point. Two tracks side by side with this big, big drag mark in the snow in between it, and pointed north, northeast at this point, and right, for, and it was pointed right to those hedge bushes. So it had to have jumped up into those hedge bushes, and somehow made it back out to the road where it didn't leave tracks, and made it back up into the hills. I don't know. I, it was it's it's odd. It really odd. Yeah, it's just interesting, you know, we hear so many times that, you know, a witness or a researcher will follow a trackway only to just see it stop as if the creature was lifted out by a helicopter. And, um, you know, I, I think sometimes people don't realize how powerful and athletic one of these creatures could actually be. Well, the one thing that folks have to realize, too, that, that don't understand is, you know, you'll have people come in and they're man trackers or whatever, but man tracking skills don't work for these Bigfoots because I can guarantee you that these Bigfoots are so strong and agile that they can jump 15 to 20 feet, okay, in one bound, in one bound, you know, and they can they can be low to the ground and they can they can shoot like an arrow and literally go 10 to 15 feet, like even sideways. So a lot of times I think they're just really good at throwing people off track. I mean. Literally, if, if you were walking in the woods and you could jump 15 or 20 feet, like to your left, to your right, all of a sudden, that's all it would take to, to get away because people aren't going to go. Most trackers don't even go that far over to look. You see what I'm saying? And and so you really have to walk what I call a circle. you got to do your circles and walk it out And because you'll be amazed when you do that. You, you might find a track further on way further on than you even imagine or even would ever think about. So, you know, we're not we're not dealing with a normal thing here. These you know, these things have extraordinary uh powers and strength and agility and if they wanna if they wanna throw you off track, I think they can do it. I just think they're that good. I don't think they're disappearing or anything. I just think they're utilizing what they can to to throw you off. I mean, I don't know, you know, because you just a lot of people don't think about it and they don't see anything in front of them and they just give up, you know. They don't think, oh, this thing could have jumped sideways or, you know. Um, anyway, yeah. So, Paul, in terms of, you know, just research and having an experience, and you said earlier, you know, you were kind of aggressive and out looking for them at the beginning, but then over the years you've learned to just be more passive and really let them come to you. You know, what would you say to a new researcher so that they're not frustrated if they don't have an encounter initially? Have fun with it, of course, always, you know. Always have fun when you're when you're in the woods, you know. That's what I tell people, too, you know. I've grown up in the woods around here, and, and I don't always have Bigfoot on my brain. You know, we, we, we do a lot of different things in the woods, and, and if you enjoy the woods and you get out 
in the woods anyway. You know, Bigfoot, he's a part of them, and yeah, you may have an encounter, you may not, but, um, you know, I just think it's it's best not to always be thinking about them, too, even when you research, you know. Be, be diligent and have your research tools with you, but just do your other things, and um, I think just a good, normal, happy camp is, is really the best way to, to draw one close to your camp and be predictable. Um, if you want them to come around, you know, for instance, go, go back and forth using the same trail. Don't, don't go off like a spider web and go in every direction all around your camp all the time poking around because then, you know, you're not giving something maybe a chance to come in. So if you're predictable and you go in one way and one out the other way all the time, you know, things like that. Um, isn't it interesting? It's just, uh, kind of like I always said about fishing, you know, when you're serious and staring at your pole and looking at your bobber, nothing's really going on. But as soon as you take your eye off it and you relax and you're talking to somebody, <laughs> you know, you get a hit. Fight like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth though. It is. But you got to be prepared. And so, you know, I, I really think the best tool, you know, people want pictures and this and that, and I have gotten a picture, and I could share that with you. Um, you know, I could share the story with you how I got it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Saturday night, I'm not going anywhere. So, basically, um, I started working with these folks over on the Olympic Peninsula, um, and uh, they had moved up here and moved into this big house way up on top of the hill with nothing but the mountains behind it. They're like the last house up. I mean, their driveway was like 15% gray, super steep getting up. And they moved in, and immediately things started happening, including getting bangs on the side of the house and then finally a sighting of this thing. And then another sighting, it ran in front of their windows when they were watching TV and other things going on. And then finally they had, they had a young gardener that they brought with them, and he was working on the property building a retaining wall taking care of all the plants and stuff while they were in town working on their, their their entrepreneurs. They had a business down in town. And so one day he's up there, and he had a rifle because there are cougars and stuff around. And basically, so their house sits on this hill, and there's this huge ravine, deep, dark ravine that goes right next to the house, and it goes all the way to a saltwater bay. And... Um, so he's standing there, and he starts hearing something down over the edge of this ravine, and he walks over the edge, grabbed his rifle, walked over the edge, and basically about 25 feet down in the ravine, poke, leaning out from a tree, is all that he can describe. I mean, he, he couldn't believe what he was seeing, but basically what he described is basically a Sasquatch hair-covered thing, humongous. Um, he put the rifle up to his face, was looking at the thing through the rifle scope almost for up to 30 seconds without that daylight. Um, freaked out. Totally, totally changed this guy's life. Um, called the, the, the homeowner immediately, and the homeowner rushed back up there, and this guy's almost in a state of shock, you know. And uh younger kid, not young, young, but he's 20, 21. And... Uh, so that night they did they sat down and they did a drawing of what he saw and, and uh did a real detailed drawing. It took like three hours. And uh so I heard about this and stuff and that's when when I decided it was like, you know, we gotta do something here and I wanted to think outside the box. I'd been working with this other organization and you know the we were working with cameras, as cameras and stuff, thanks to Wally Hersom, and I got got a few cameras from him, and we were uh, putting cameras up and doing all that kind of stuff. But we started finding out to, from a couple locations that when we put the cameras up, the stuff stopped happening. It, it didn't seem like these Bigfoots were coming around anymore, and so it was kind of a deterrent in a way. And, and you know, I was seeing that, and so it was like I didn't want to just put a bunch of cameras up at this place, you know, and, and have everything just go, you know, like nothing again. So I was like, okay, we got to trick these guys. We got to think outside of the box. So it was like, I do, I do concrete work. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to make a fake rock and big enough to fit a game camera inside of it. Why not? We'll just try it, you know? So these folks have this big rock garden um, and this little bridge before it goes over into their house. 
and that's right on the edge of the ravine. So I stuck this rock that I made, and I stamped it with the stamps to look like a real rock and colored it. It was gray. I mean, it looked, looked like a big boulder, you know, but there was a little cavity in there for the camera. So I drove it over there. You know, it was a little after the guy had seen, seen the thing, and we got it all placed. And then now we need to fast forward about nine months. It's about nine months later that he that the homeowner called me. And he only checked his cameras about every five months. Those those batteries last a long time in those things. I think he checked it two times. And the second time that he checked it, after it had been there like four months, there was one night that he got a picture. And, and the camera's set up to take three pictures in about five seconds when there's a when there's a a trigger when it triggers so you know and he sent it to me and it was like well what the heck what what is that and i'm looking at it like okay well it looks like an eye and what's that and what's that and, and then, so i drew something up kind of thinking what i what what i thought it might be and then all of a sudden he remembered the drawing that he'd done and he sent me the drawing back I looked at the drawing, and then he set the drawing, and he overlaid the, the game cam picture on it, and it was just like I just got the chills because it was just like, oh, my gosh, that's it. And it matches perfectly. So what, in the picture that I got, basically this thing's about probably two feet away from the camera. That and I think it came right up the ravine, poked its head up, because one second later is all you see is a little bit of heat signature down in the left-hand corner where it ducked back down. But the first picture, there's like it shows the forehead, eye, the nose bridge, the beginning of another eye, and all the wrinkles up above the – and, I mean, when it's overlaid on that eyewitness drawing that was done nine months before, it's, like, eerily, like, matches. So we're pretty sure we've, – we've had – oh, gosh, Jeff, did Jeff Meldrum spent the weekend there. Bill Munns came up, actually, and brought Clay up and spent the weekend there and, and met with the – witness and did a clay bust head of the whole of the thing that we saw there was two scars on it, it looked like a cougar or something it scratched its face too and the kid totally remembered that when he saw it so yeah I, I could send you that picture but yeah i'll just send you the three original pictures then i'll send you the eyewitness drawing picture and then i'll send you it with it with the with the picture overlaid on the drawing yeah, and thanks uh, for sending me pictures. I'll also put that in that uh, member area out on our website for those registered. Thank you. So, Paul, just kind of getting back to uh, Wenatchee and Central Washington and those, you know, that come over from Seattle and they take I-90 over Blewett or Highway 2 over Stevens, you know, that's a pretty dense area up there, too, even, a, you know, above Lake Wenatchee and, um, you know, just a lot of uh, encounters that we run across uh, out here, uh, both myself and, of course, you and others here in the valley that, uh, you know, hear stories and are around here, but maybe talk a little bit about, you know, maybe any of the roadside uh, sightings you've heard about or uh, anything you've investigated recently. There was uh, one of my very good friends that I do work with. His sister just saw one on Blue two winters ago now, but she was driving over, just headed to Seattle early in the morning, and she had just dropped down the other side where you drop them down the other side, and there's that big, long straightaway kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it crossed from the left to the right, right there, right in front of her car. Yeah, it seems like every time I get down to on the other side, going back towards 90, right where the Swalk campground is and some of those areas down there, it's just uh, it's just really squatchy there on Blewett. But uh, a lot of places, you know, on either highway and, of course, the North Cascades Highway 20, I mean, there's just, just uh, a lot of possibilities for roadside encounters. Yep. I got a brand new one. I just got on to, um, I'm trying to contact the guy, but it's a logger, and he, he just saw it two days ago up off Stevens Pass. So I'm trying to track I'm trying to track it down. I got a lead on it, but, yeah, yes, it, he drove up a little logging road right outside where they were logging, and uh, the thing crossed right in front of his car, and he, it was close enough he could smell it. He said it looked like it weighed seven to 800 pounds. So, Paul, a lot of people probably don't know how long you've been doing this, but uh, we're talking a long time, um, and not to get into too many years, but more than 25 years. And so not a lot of researchers can say that. But, you know, at the beginning, you didn't have a lot of influences, you know, to really help you on your path. I mean, there was no, you know, rule book on how to go about this. And um, certainly, you know, we 
the research is worth the cause. We continue to promote and, you know, try to get this right and, uh, you know, try to get the next gen inspired. But when you were starting out, how did you stay inspired and did you have any influences? Um, yeah. So early on, you know, there was, you know, the, the early guys that wrote, wrote some of the early books, of course, John Green and uh, Renee Dahinden, I guess, were a couple of my big, you know, early influences. Um, but, you know, since then, I mean, I've, I've met a lot of great people and, and uh, John Anderson, for one, you know, who's been researching for over 50 years, which, by the way, him and his wife just moved here to Wenatchee. And so I want to welcome John and his wife to the Wenatchee Valley. Um, John's been researching for over 50 years and just a great guy and, and um, great to get out and hike with. I mean, the guy hikes like you would not believe. I mean, it's so um yeah, so John Andrews, um, John, my other good friend, colleague, John Bindernagel, who I've done a lot of work with, and he uses some of my material in some of his talks, and John and his wife, I just I just love John, and he's, he's a great in, inspiration for kind of becoming a citizen scientist, you know, and, and, and uh, seeing what he does and, and how enthusiastic he is, you know, and it just it, it rubs off on you. Absolutely. I couldn't have uh, said that any better. And uh, John's a, uh, a dear friend and a super great human being as well. Um, but getting into some of the later research, I want to give a heads up to Mel Scahan, a uh, good good friend from from the Yakima Nation down, down in Yakima. And Mel's got a lot of knowledge about these things, and, and he works for the forestry uh, department for the Yakima Nation. So um, we got out early and did a lot of the early stuff. In fact, I think my the first BFRO uh, expedition I went on, Mel was uh, the one that called me and got me all hooked up. So want to give a shout out to him. Then of course meeting Bob Gimlin. Bob's been a great inspiration to me, not just Bigfoot related, but life in general. I mean the guy's, you know, tough as nails and and just he never gives up and he's works like so hard you just wouldn't even believe it and uh yeah we we spent some great nights out in the woods together shared many, many campfires and and uh so and of course as you know we just had the thing here in Wenatchee so that was really cool and it went really good uh it was I mean it was packed in there so and then uh also Chris Murphy for his professionalism in writing books and helping me with a couple papers I wrote on uh, the Sasquatch sign and symbol structures, sign and symbol, so it, which is available on uh, Sasquatch Canvas website. Chris Murphy's got a virtual museum in there, and there's a lot of great uh, information in there and research done over the years. And I've got a section in there on the sign and symbol, so I want to give a heads up to Chris. Yeah, and so there's, you know, I've met a lot of good people. There really is some great people out there. Tom Powell, you know, the, the, some of the, the Oregon crew, Toby Johnson, you know, just people that, that keep you positive. And and I I kind of bowed away from the, the the whole kind of Bigfoot, not community, but you just some of the stuff because it was just, especially the last five years, just the way things changed, you know. And um, I guess I've just been more growing up here just been always more of a boots on boots on the ground type of researcher and, and been out there and not, not I'm not used to getting online and arguing about stuff you know so <laughs> I just want to try to keep everything as positive we can I think we need that anyway in this world now so um, absolutely and you know that's really what a syndicate's all about you know a group of individuals or groups that uh you know, are combined to promote a common interest. And, uh, you know, while many people are divided on the topic, um, you know, really our goal is to unite. So couldn't have said that any better. You know, if we can just share our stuff, you know, but everyone has different ways and ideas about doing it too, you know. And, and so but I, I kind of like John Vindernagel's idea about, you know, some of this stuff you just, you put up on, you, you research it, you put it up on the shelf. One day you might get it back down from the shelf, you know. Um, might not be ready right now for, for whatever reason, but you just got to keep plugging away and, and um, you know, doing 
doing what you love and, and like, you know, and if it's being out in the woods, then that's, that's a big plus right there. So. Absolutely. Well, Paul, uh, thanks again for coming on Sasquatch Syndicate. We really do appreciate it. Uh, it was a fantastic evening for me and hopefully for all of our listeners. And, uh, we really look forward to having you back on the show at some point and, uh, really appreciate your positive outlook. So thanks again for coming on. No, well, thank you. Yeah, you too. And, uh, Maybe we'll get out and share a campfire one of these times out in the woods. So thank you, Chuck. Take care over there. Okay, have a good one. This concludes our October 2017 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Wednesday, November 1st. Thanks to all our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject. So for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.